seated. Hey Amen. Well, good morning. Uh, just briefly, one announcement that I missed. We will have a leaders meeting today at 2.30 over at Diane's house. And again, it will be just for the Bible Talk leaders so we can talk through the month. Amen. Well, um, I have good and bad news. Just kind of depends on how you look at it. I don't have a watch today. Let's be turn our Bibles to Mark chapter 14. You know, I heard a story. There was a couple in New York City, and they were hailing down a cab. And as the cab approached, the man and his wife, of course, ran over to get into the cab. And as he was opening the door, another older man jumped in front of them and got in the cab. And so the wife went to the husband and said, hey, why, why did you just let that guy take our cab? And he goes, oh, he, he really needed it. She goes, honey, we needed it. We're, we're, we're almost late to this thing. He goes, no, you don't understand. He was late to his karate class, and he's the instructor. Oh. You know, it's funny how a lot of times we'll be motivated by fear. Is that not true? Oh. And I think as Christians, very too often, we're motivated by fear instead of motivated by a greater love. The title of our message this morning is A Greater Love. We're going to read this incredible passage that I really believe will help us understand what it means to show our love for Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 14, let's pick up the reading in verse 3. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the house of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his beard. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you and you can help them any time you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare my burial. I tell you the truth. Wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. This is a very remarkable account of this woman. In fact, it's stated in all four Gospels. Let's look at another account of the same situation in John chapter 12. John 12 verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint, a pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. Have you ever seen over-the-top outpouring of affection? Outpouring of celebration? That's exactly what's going on here with Mary. 
You know, evidently, she's from a wealthy family. You see, nowadays, with your jobs, you usually get a retirement fund. And there's some sort of plan for when you retire for the company to take care of you with a pension and things like that. Back then, there was nothing of the, of, of the sorts. Back then, you take your money and you save it, and very often people would invest their money into a commodity. A very popular choice of a commodity back then was nard. You see, nard was number one, it was desirable. Everybody wanted it, it smelled amazing. Number two, it was portable. You could put it in a little jar and trade it and, and carry it with you wherever you went. And number three is negotiable. You could buy various amounts depending on how much you wanted to invest. It was a very popular choice for savings. You see, nard is an expensive perfume that is created from a plant grown in northern India. And so if you had nard, you were considered a wealthy individual. And so this woman, Mary, is coming from that sort of background. In fact, many of the people around noticed that the amount of perfume was worth about a year's wage. That's incredible. I don't know how much some of you guys make annually, but that's not the point. The point is, if anybody nowadays has a year's salary in their savings, we would probably consider that person rich. And so back then, she's got a whole year's salary saved up already. Wow. And what does she do with it? Well, the Bible says that this stuff was, was very expensive. So number one, it was too good for her to use on herself. Number two, we learned that Lazarus just died and it was used for burial and she didn't even use it on Lazarus. So it was too good for him. But lastly, we see that it wasn't good enough for Jesus. You see, it was part of their ritual that if you were going to anoint somebody or if someone needed a little deodorant, you would open up the bottle, put your finger around the rim and put a drop on that individual. Mary doesn't do that, does she? I mean, how do you thank the man that just raised your brother from the dead? How do you thank the man? Do you give him a little drop? Would that be enough? You see, I don't think people would look down on her if she only did the drop. I think they would see that as, wow, she's investing part of her life savings to show appreciation for this guy, Jesus. But that wasn't good enough for her. So what did she do? She breaks the jar, signifying there was gonna be no more life savings. And she pours it on his feet. Wow, come on. She gets down on her knees, on her face, and she wipes it with her hair. Isn't that what you do when you're grateful? You just throw yourself down. Nothing is too much. Love, doesn't count the cost. Come on. You see, it would have been sensible just to use a little bit of her savings. But Mary wasn't about being sensible. Mary was about sacrifice. And by the very definition of sacrifice, you give something up for someone or something else that you love more. She gave up her future. She gave up her savings. She gave up her dream because she loved Jesus more. You see, for us, we know what it means to sacrifice. You know, I've, I've heard stories of people flying across the country to go visit a girlfriend or go visit a boyfriend. Airfare, hotel, food. They'll, they'll pay that price to go show their love for the other person. Parents, we sacrifice for our kids. Some of you, your kids grow up, they want to get involved in sports, you got to get them the equipment. They want to get involved in an instrument, you got to get them the instrument. Then all the traveling costs, I mean, there's a sacrifice that comes with raising your children. You love them more than the money in your pocket and you see that their dreams are aspired to. You have it out 
for them. You know, this, this account is mentioned in all four Gospels, and all four Gospels share it right before the cross. You see, Mary was going to be a story that was going to be told for generations upon generations. This was going to be an account to look back at and to learn what appreciation and love for Jesus and his sacrifice was all about. Amen. And that's what Mary was surely doing. You know, we often sacrifice when we feel inspired. I heard a story of this biker guy who started coming out to church. He had the tattoos, the leather jacket, the big Harley, the bandana on his head. He comes out to church, he starts studying the Bible, and he, he becomes a Christian. He gets saved. And from the pulpit up front, they asked for volunteers for people who would go and serve in the children's ministry. And as he looked around, not too many people were raising their hands. So he, of course, being a, a zealous young Christian, raises his hand and goes, I'll serve the children. I'll serve in the nursery. And of course, that inspired all the young moms in the room to raise their hands and go, no, I'll do it. I'll do it. See, that's inspiration. That's inspiration. You see an example, and you're inspired by it, and now you're motivated to go do something about it. I have three points for you this morning. Number one, greater love is always extravagant. You see, the Bible never says that this is the least you can do to love God. In fact, the Bible says that we're not just going to evangelize our community, we're going to evangelize the world. The Bible doesn't say that, that when you pray, you should, you know, just kind of do it as you walk around sitting on your hands. No, it says your hands should be in the air. You should be talking to the Lord. You know, the Bible says that when we praise God, we should, we should be on our knees. We should be prostrate, laying before God. It is always extravagant. That is the standard of the scriptures. And when you really love God, you take things to that next level. You're not looking for the middle ground. You don't want to be lukewarm. You're not looking for the least you can do to get into heaven. You want to be extravagant for God. You know, there's this uh, music artist named Ricky Skaggs, and I really believe he encaptures this in one of his songs. He says, it happens to a mother when she is giving birth. Her heart is filled with joy while her body is filled with hurt. She holds the baby to her breast despite the pain it caused. When it comes to love, you don't count the cost. It happens to a soldier fighting for his home. Fear wells up inside him, and yet he still goes on. Even though he knows he may be the next to fall, when it comes to love, you don't count the cost. It happens all around us each and every day. Someone's given all they got for someone else's sake. If you're ever doubted, just think about the cross. Because when it comes to love, you don't count the cost. You don't count the heartache. You don't count the sacrifice. All that counts is what you feel inside. It doesn't really matter what is gained or what is lost. When it comes to love, you don't count the cost. You see, greater love is always extravagant. It's always over the top. That is a greater love. You see, Mary gave up her future. She broke the alabaster jar, which was her future. I really believe that love is measured in abandonment, not in calculation. Come on. You mean God, like love, costs something. It costs something. When you really love God, or you love somebody else, you give something up for Him. I think we all need to understand that cautious, calculated discipleship is a contradiction. When you are sold 
out like Mary was. You don't sit down and calculate how much you can or can't. You just give it all to him. Point number two, greater love is always an irritative. You know, some people, they see that your relationship with God has cost you everything. And those are the people that get irritated by your example. I think there are a lot of people that know the cost of everything, but the value of nothing. They can put a price tag on anything you show them, but they don't really understand the value behind that alabaster jar. They criticize other people's sacrifice, other people's love. And you know something funny and ironic about criticism is it often reveals more about the critic than it does about the person being criticized. The heart is revealed. The heart is exposed when we look across the board and get critical. Very often, I've seen even in my life, I criticize, maybe you can relate, when I'm trying to cover up my shallow version of discipleship. Come on. I'm comfortable where I'm at, and so I can point the finger to everybody else. Try to pull them down. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, we have to understand that when there's a greater love for Jesus, it's going to bother some people. You're going to look crazy to people. But that's okay because it's a greater love for Jesus. Your life should look a little crazy to people that love anything more than they love Jesus. And when it looks a little crazy, they might get critical and persecute. Are you ready for the persecution that comes with the cross? Let's go to point number three. Greater love is always significant. It's always significant. You know, when you really love God, you may not get the praise of all those around you, but you will get the praise of him. Amen. You will get the praise of God. It is significant. God notices. You won't find throughout the Gospels, Jesus give more praise to any other individual than he did to Mary right here. In fact, what does he say? For all time, when the gospel is preached, it'll be accompanied by this story. People will learn about who Mary was. But you know, they will also talk about Judas. They will also talk about the greed that was in Judas's heart. The lack of conviction. The lack of discipleship. The lack of sold out commitment. That is also part of the story. You know, I often think, what is my story? Maybe you've thought about that. What is, what is your story? How will you be remembered? Will you be remembered like Mary or will you be remembered like Judas? What is the story that goes with your life? You know, I heard this story of this monk that was walking on a road and as he was traveling, he found this rock. And when he picked up the rock, he realized it was actually a gem. And so he puts it in his, his little sack there and he continues walking. Well, just a couple hours later, a poor person comes up to him, also traveling on the same road and goes, excuse me, sir, do you have any provisions, any money, any food that can help me along my way? So he opens up his sack to, to try to see what he might be able to give him. And the poor guy sees the gem and he goes, well, can I have that? The monk being a man that just got it, he goes, absolutely, sure. And, and he gives it to the poor guy. The poor guy goes on his way, and a couple days later, he goes and he finds the monk. And he found him, he found him and, he, and he gives him the gem back. And he goes, you know what? I've come to realize it's not the gem that I want. I want whatever it is you had that gave me this gem. When you, when you realize what you've received from God, you give it freely to other people. Yeah. There is no questions asked. There is a love that, that doesn't need to count the cost. You give it freely to those around you. You know, this story of Mary, it doesn't make any sense, 
aside from one fact, a greater love. It doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> you know, a lot of people think that the story of Jesus is crazy. They understand that he died on the cross for their sins and all this other, but they don't really get it. it. It looks insane. Why would a guy ever do something like that? They think that it's, it's out there. And because it's such a ridiculous story, they don't want to put their faith in God. Look over just a couple pages later in chapter 15. Verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You know, we are called by Jesus to lay our lives down for each other. You know, when Jesus was there at, at the home of Lazarus, we see that Martha was serving. And if you know Martha, there's no surprise there. And of course, Lazarus is laying down on the couch. No surprise there. The woman serving, the guy chilling. But you know, Jesus is there too. And I think we almost get a little visual for what our lives could look like. You can either have a serving heart like Mary, like Alexa was talking about during her awesome communion message. Or you can be a lot like Lazarus. You don't want to lay down your life. You just want to lay down. <laughs> You're just kind of chilling. Just waiting for things to be served to you. You come to church just taking everybody's energy. Just, just can't wait for the sermon to be over. I mean, there is this, this selfishness inside of you. Or we could have the heart of Martha. Have the heart of Mary, which was to give as much as we can. You know, Jesus lay down for a debt that we couldn't pay down. He put it all on the line. He laid down on that cross. No one had to make him do it because he understood what was at stake. You know, he took on all the pain and the guilt and the sin of the world. Just like Mary poured the entire alabaster jar out onto his feet. You ever think about that? You ever think about the fact that she pours it all out? Just like all the wrath, all the pain that we're supposed to be feeling was laid out onto Jesus? You ever think about the fact that we've just been saved from so much heartache, so much pain, that Jesus bore it all? You know, so many people do not understand the sacrifice of Jesus. Therefore, they don't have a greater love for him. I want to close with two simple challenges. Two simple challenges. Number one, ask the Holy Spirit to increase your capacity to be motivated by love, not fear. Pray to God to help you understand true love and allow it to motivate you to get closer to him and to do his will. Number two, ask God to help you receive his love because God has a great level of love for each and every one of us, a great appreciation for each and every one of you. And guys, as we go into the holidays here, I want to encourage you to have the heart of Mary, to have a greater love to throw it all out on the line so that we can show our appreciation to Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, and to God be the glory. Yeah.